What's happening, y'all? Welcome inside the Fantasy Stock Exchange. Danny and Bush coming at you with our, our season review, basically. This is the 2020 fantasy season, lessons we learned this season. And basically what we're going to be doing, the concept of what we're doing, is we're taking claims or takes or, or ideas or philosophies that we had earlier this season before drafts happened, and we're going to reflect on if they were if they were correct, if they were wrong, what we learned from them as a result, and how we can carry it forward into next year. So I think this is going to be a really fun episode. Danny, how you doing? Doing well, doing well. And yeah, as you mentioned, I, I'm completely looking forward to this episode because again, as smart as we think we are, as smart as the industry really thinks they are, we can all take away and we can all learn from each season and how it happens, how it unfolds. And talking about 2020, based off what we had in the off season versus what we know now, there's a ton of things that can really be learned. So just being able to overall uh, highlight and explain how or what influenced our decision making over the course of this season is ultimately just going to provide you guys with value. So we learned a lot from this video and hopefully you guys can gather a lot from it as well. Yeah. And the difference between me and Danny or any like uh, good fantasy player and between them and the average fantasy player is maybe we get 56% of what we think correct. And the average fantasy player gets 51% correct. But guess what? That 5% is a James Robinson. It's an Antonio Gibson. It's one of these guys that can win you a league and help you hoist a championship, which you're going to see my trophy in the background of the videos going forward. And you're going to see why I got it uh, based on stuff like this. So let's, before we get into this, we'll hit the intro and then we'll uh, get into the first claim here. All right, so the first claim we have, this is a thing that me and you are both adamant on yeah. this. Neither of us like this guy. Aaron Rodgers is going to be a bust. This is what we thought going into the season. Now, what is the lesson we can take away from this? Uh, one, that Aaron Rodgers is just super talented, obviously, right? Aaron Rodgers is one of the most talented quarterbacks of all time. It goes Dan Marino, Aaron Rodgers, and then probably Patrick Mahomes in that conversation for most talented quarterbacks of all time. But the lesson we learned from Aaron Rodgers, and I think this is really key, is continuity. Continuity is... And not only that, but the second year in the system bump, if you want to call it that. This is the same exact offense, right? They, this year, they have the exact same players, really outside of Robert Tanyan's emergence. Adams missed a couple games last year. He missed a couple games this year. MVS still drops passes. The, uh, last year, he dropped them. He, this year, he's dropped them. Alan Lazard was banged up last year. He was banged up this year. Aaron Jones and Jamal Williams were still there. AJ Dillon wasn't really even that involved until last week. So this is the same exact situation for Aaron Rodgers, but the difference was continuity and the second year in the same offense. That basically translated from Matt LaFleur's first year, which was 2019. They scored 15th most points in the league. Uh, this year, they scored the first. They, they scored the most points in the league this year. Compared to last year, they're scoring 15th. And last year, they had 18th most yards in the league to third this year. So the biggest difference for Aaron Rodgers, and there's we're going to see this carry forward into next year, is um, the fact that he was in... A comfortable situation as he'd been in the offense for a full year already even without no OTAs and all that kind of stuff this year that that familiarity he got last year in Matt LaFleur's offense was enough to make him break out essentially yeah for sure and I, and I agree on that aspect again people were going to refer back to the bus video on our channel the quarterback that I put on my bus list was in fact Aaron Rodgers now what can we really gather from it as you mentioned second year in Matt LaFleur's system I was using the baseline of judging Aaron Rodgers as being regression. When in reality, I mean, 2017, he had a, uh, a year where that was cut short, seven games. What happened? He got hurt. Next year, following year, played 16 games, had a lackluster year by his standards. What happened? Well, his coach was out the door. The team was finishing 6-9-1. and nine and, one. and in reality, I mean, the year that a coach is basically going to get fired off of isn't necessarily a great year to base the quarterback's performance off of because, heck, would you really be motivated if you know your coach isn't making it out of the season? That's probably where Aaron Rodgers was at mentally. And finally, Especially someone like Rodgers, who we we basically, it was documented, they had tumult between those two guys yes. anyway. Maybe he just straight up won and McCarthy fired in general. Yeah, and then obviously last year, again, dealt without his receiver wide receiver one for a few games, was in the first year of Matt LaFleur's system. Now we see this year. Dude is the best quarterback in football the way he's been playing this year. Yeah, he's yes, my MVP. He went he wins it if it's if you ask me. He's my MVP as well. And I mean, that's a big loss that I got from this season is saying that this guy's gonna be a bust. Because in reality, hey, we live and we learn. And Aaron Rodgers is a big learning point for me going into projecting forward. So 
Yeah. And speaking of Rodgers, his numbers, the difference in his numbers, I'll have it on the screen right now. But basically, in terms of fantasy points, he had over six more fantasy points per game, 26.77 fantasy points per game at the quarterback position is good for a top three quarterback for him. Uh, pass attempts were actually, he passing the ball less this year than he was last year. 35 pass attempts uh, per game last year, 33 per game this year. But he's thrown about the same interceptions. He has five interceptions on the season right now. He had four last year. But the passing touchdowns was the big deal. He had nearly three passing touchdowns per game this year and uh, only one and a half last year. And then his passing yards per attempt, 8.64 yards per attempt is, is tremendous. That's MVP caliber uh, compared to 7.12, which is still, I mean, it's not terrible. It's it's like an average, it's like Jared Goff numbers, basically. And uh, passing yardage was, was pretty similar, about 20 uh, more passing yards per game. The, the difference was really efficiency and that comes with being comfortable in an offense as we touched on. So um, I think... Going forward, we, the big implication of this is that we have a number of guys next year going into their second year in offenses, right? That's what we're trying to do with this exercise is continue this into next year and take away what we can take away from. The biz, biggest example to me is Tom Brady. Tom Brady is going to the second year of Bruce Aaron's offense next year. And new quarterback is, is basically the same thing. He has been in the same system for 20 years. And this year, he and you can see it towards the end of the season, they're starting to get more comfortable in the system. Again, they had no OTAs, no offseason, all that kind of stuff. And there's a number of other guys, Baker Mayfield also going into the second year of Kevin Stefanski's offense. This is, this is a thing that a trend that we're going to need to keep track of going into next year. And it needs to be considered a positive for those who are staying in the same system they were in the previous year is that that's, that's a big thing in people's corner. If they were in the same system um, going into drafts, that's one less thing that you have to worry about if you're going to draft them. Right. So uh, I think that's, that's a pretty big, uh, explanation on that, uh, claim that we had there and that lesson that we learned. So why don't you get into your first one? Uh, I'm going to quickly, uh, briefly mention if you guys saw me looking to the side, that's just because Najee Harris ripped off a huge run and hurdled the guy in the process. So anyways, nice. back to the point, my first claim that I'm going to mention is how wrong I was about the DJ Moore breakout, not necessarily the breakout itself, but more so the implications and the timing of the breakout. Okay. So again, the lesson that I take away from this is that new systems and situations take time to gel. You mentioned with Aaron Rodgers, his year one in Matt LaFleur system. Well, DJ Moore was in year one of the system run by Matt Rowe as his coach and Joe Brady as the offense coordinator. What can we learn from this? Slow starts are going to happen. We got to, we got to anticipate that people that are in new systems run by new coaches are going to take time to gel. And as we saw this year, the splits of DJ Moore in his first four games compared to his last 10, four being, you know, getting acclimated to the position or to the situation, uh, gaining his role as a number one receiver. Again, new quarterback, new system. How did that take effect? Well, his point per game in PPR went from 11.7 in the first four games to 14.96 in the last 10 games of the season. 14.96 is good enough for a top 15, top 20 type wide receiver. So you really saw that he lived up to expectations once he was able to really grasp the system, gain that status under Matt LaFleur, or not Matt LaFleur, Matt Rule and um, Joe Brady. So that's my main point here. Uh, teams like, as you mentioned, going into their second season with a new coach would be uh, the New York Giants, the Chicago Bears, Cleveland Browns, Denver Broncos, Houston Texans, Jacksonville Jaguars, LA Rams, Minnesota, et cetera. They've all had new play callers in 2020. And there's many more on that list that disappointed you were bottom scoring offenses, as I know you're going to brief into with your tweet that you're going to put up. Yeah, on the so the tweet, you're going to see it on the screen right now. Basically, the, the teams Danny's talking about, all of these teams had new offensive play callers. So they didn't, didn't necessarily have new head coaches or anything like that, but they had new offensive play callers or new offensive coordinators. And basically the correlation being that they were low scoring offenses. And the only two on that list that weren't low scoring offenses were the Cleveland Browns and the, and the Chicago Bears who did get out to very slow starts despite being pretty good offenses towards the end of the season. So that's the big takeaway is that new offensive coordinators, new play callers is going to lead to slow starts and that's going to affect um, quarterbacks, wide receivers, running backs, tight ends, all that kind of stuff. For sure. And as I mentioned as well, those, those last 10 games, once everything really took to form and we truly saw how the offense is going to operate, DJ Moore was just fine. Four catches per game, 81 receiving yards per game. We really saw over the stretch of the season, he really became the guy that we both thought he was. It just took time to really set into that situation. So maybe you got a guy going into a new situation for the next year. Don't necessarily draft him, 
but maybe trade for him at a value after those first four games because they could be had at value. If you were to buy DJ Moore after those first four games, 11.7 PPR points. Per I game. traded him for Deshaun Watson after those first four games. Yeah. So that, that just shows kind of a good trade for me because I had receiver depth, but DJ Moore really stung me. He did yeah. he did perform down the stretch. And I mean, wide receiver, 15 points per, uh, per game for wide receiver is like top 15 production. So yeah. he was definitely productive to the point that we thought, we thought like top 15 was about his like, not his floor, but like, the range that was very yeah. easily expected out of DJ Moore with a ceiling for much more, obviously. I think next year, DJ Moore specifically is is a prime candidate to be a huge breakout candidate because of the second year in the system and all that kind of stuff. We saw him completely supplant Robbie Anderson when that was just not the case early in the season. Yeah, for sure. Again, all those numbers went up like in the longer part of the season after that initial, not necessarily, like I'll, I'll he just say- played struggle. better too. His, his yeah. volume was pretty similar. Uh, early in those in those games, he had pretty similar volume. He just played so much better, and obviously that was a result of his connection with the quarterback and the system being uh, finally implemented the way that they wanted it to. For sure. All right, so the next uh, claim that we got here, and this one was definitely a miss again. So I thought Gardner Minshew was going to be a top 15 quarterback. He actually was. Uh, if you go to points per game, he actually was a top 15 quarterback in points per game, but that didn't help you at all because he wasn't the starter most of the season and all that kind of stuff. And con uh, subsequently, I also thought DJ Chark would be a top 15 wide receiver. And basically the lesson that you can take out of this is always, always, always favor good offenses and good situations. It should always be a tiebreaker, a, a notch in the other person's uh, category. When we do ADP battles and all that kind of stuff, yeah. it's going to be something that is very much uh, in favor of one player over another. Scoring opportunities are the bread and butter for all fantasy positions, for quarterbacks, for running backs, for wide receivers, for tight ends touchdowns help win you weeks. So myself being so high on Gardner Minshew as I was and high on DJ Chark as a result, who they were, we knew they were going to be a bad team. We knew they were going to have a top five pick going into the season. They have the number one overall pick this season. That was not smart of me. The top 12 running backs, if you go through them this season, they're on the screen right now. The ones that are highlighted are ones that were on offenses that finished in the top 18 in scoring. And the, as you can see on that list, the only ones that did not are Christian McCaffrey only played three games but I decided to put him on there just to show how good he is. Uh, James Robinson, who is a special case and is actually on the very offense I'm talking about, but that was just obscene volume. That had absolutely nothing to do with scoring opportunities or anything like that. That was just a talented player getting obscene volume. And then Joe Mixon, who only played six games. So the rest of those of the, guys. And just mentioning with Joe Mixon, one of those games really skewed his overall points. Yeah, exactly. Game. Yeah. Played six games. One of them was a what, 45, 50 point outing. Like that's going to skew your overall production. Yeah, but the rest of those guys, all of them came from top 18 scoring offenses, and that's exactly what you need at the one, uh, running back position. At the wide receiver position, on the screen right now, you'll see the top 15 wide receivers in points per game. The only guys on this list that did not come from top 20 scoring offenses or top 18 scoring offenses are Will Fuller and Keenan Allen. The rest of those guys, Adams, Hill, Diggs, Ridley, Metcalf, all those guys came from good offenses. That's just basically how fantasy works. If, you, if you're ever caught in a situation you find yourself overthinking a player, just think to think to yourself, common sense. Are they are they attached to a good quarterback, a good play caller, good offense? Uh, do they have good pieces around them that can help uh, generate uh, yards and scoring opportunities for them? All that kind of stuff contributes to good fantasy production and getting falling in love with players that are from bad situations, bad offenses was a narrative I was peddling clearly. And they'd be behind in games too is my, my thing was uh, Jacksonville was going to get scored on a lot. So Gardner Minshew and DJ Chark are going to be throwing the ball like crazy. But to some extent that was true, but that didn't apply to Jacksonville because their defense was so bad that they were just getting so many plays ran against them. And they were never on the field as an offense. As you can see on the screen right now, the top five offenses in terms of or defenses in terms of plays ran against them, meaning their defense is just on the field all the time. You could see Las Vegas, Arizona, Houston, Philadelphia, and Jacksonville. Those were five of the offenses, I would say, that were most disappointing outside of Arizona. Um, Las Vegas, a lot of people were dis disappointed with the players they drafted from that team, except for Darren Waller, Houston, same thing, except for, I, I mean, I guess they were so good because of Deshaun Watson, but in terms of actual plays ran, they weren't that good. And then Philadelphia, a lot of people were disappointed with what they drafted from that team. And then Jacksonville, same thing. So I think the moral of the story, draft good players, good offenses, good situations, good quarterbacks, good play, uh, uh, good play callers. All of those factors contribute to a good fantasy asset and one you want to invest in. For sure, for sure. That's a really good lesson to actually uh, take forward from the season as well, as you mentioned. Uh, my second one that I'm actually going to claim, well, the claim that I made 
was CH is going to be an elite fantasy option. He was a mid first round pick by me. I believe my RB five or six going into the season. And the lesson that I'm really taking out of this is don't just assume rational coaching, rational coaching decisions, rational team decisions, unless they've already proven it. And in reality, I mean, again, this was by far my biggest hit in the off season, my biggest hit on the chin. If you drafted CH anywhere close to where I was telling you to draft them, it was a bus pick. And let me just say, yes, Going into the season, Damian Williams, top 10 running back uh, on points per game the previous year. Well, Clyde, as much as I believed in the talent, he still had to prove himself. He's still a rookie. A lot of these situations, betting just simply on a late first-round rookie to just step in immediately and take that workload, it's not going to be for every Josh Jacobs, every Ezekiel Elliott, every Saquon Barkley. There's always going to be guys who, in reality, don't let the expectations. Sony Michelle is a prime one as well. If you're actually looking at the case, though, this one specifically has to do with the coaching, the GM, the team decision of really bringing in Le'Veon Bell when he became uh, available. Because as you guys are going to see on the screen, CH is split in terms of overall opportunity, in terms of overall points per game, in terms of overall production. Took a huge nosedive once the acquisition of Bell came to fruition. So as you see here, the six games without Bell, he averaged 15.87 PPR points per game on 23 opportunities per game. That number cut to 11.54 PPR points per game on 18, or sorry, not even 18, my bad, 14 opportunities per game. He went from 23 to 14 opportunities per game in the splits with and without Bell. Now, what did that do in his yards from scrimmage? His yards from scrimmage dropped from a staggering almost 114 per game to under 60. The only real reason his numbers are even close is because of the increase in touchdowns because he had terrible touchdown luck over those first six games. He was everything you wanted from him in those first six games. Once Bell got brought in, nothing like the same player. And yes, this just may seem like a thing of bad luck. Oh my God, I can't believe it. I dropped this guy to be what he was. He was that for the first six and then he fell off. But again... Don't expect rational decisions to be made. Teams I think the rational decision was made, to be honest, because what, what you look at with Clyde. From a fantasy is, perspective, I mean. Yeah, from a fantasy perspective, yeah. don't expect the rational coaching decision to be made where you're like, oh, well, like they drafted this guy in the first round. They should use him, right? That's the yeah. rational decision of a fantasy player. But Clyde was not performing. And I'm sure there's going to be some metrics that Clyde did well in, like forcing missed tackles and stuff like that. But the bottom line is they gave this guy, what, like seven goal line 20. carries in the first game? Seven in the first game, 23 total opportunities per game, and yet he did, He just wasn't able to He didn't to punch the ball in the end zone. That's what he needed to do. There was there was plays where he dropped passes and stuff too. Like there was, And we, we talked about this before the show. How much better would uh, the Kansas City Chiefs rookie running back have been if it was DeAndre Swift or if it was J.K. Dobbins or if it was even Jonathan Taylor? If they it was have Cam Akers. They, they probably would have, would have done better than Clyde. I bet you all four of those guys would have done better than Clyde. Yeah. And – this could be as simple as just Clyde's not a very good player. Like that could be very possible, but I don't think that's the case. I think what Andy Reid noticed was that Clyde was having some trouble acclimating to the NFL and the rational decision as a coach, not as a fantasy player, is to throw the ball. You have Patrick Mahomes, you have Tyreek Hill, you have Travis Kelsey. Why are you running the ball when your running back is not necessarily getting the job done when you have all these passing weapons? There, yeah. There's no reason to be forcing the ball to Clyde Ritzelaire just because you took him in the first round. Yeah, I mean, as you see with those two splits, you bring another running back in because he's not performing. That's a simple coaching decision. Yes, we don't want to hear about that from a fantasy aspect. We want all of our running backs to be in situations of their own where they can get 23 opportunities per game, where they can produce 114 scrimmage yards per game. But if you're not helping the team from a real-life aspect, if you're not punching the ball in, if you're missing some assignments in the pass blocking game... Oh, that gonna, was a big deal too, for sure. They're going to they're gonna find a way to really... Not necessarily eliminate all of your production, but heck, as we saw, what Le'Veon Bell was. That's why they brought him in. That had to be like they were like. There's no way you bring in Le'Veon Bell if if J.K. Dobbins is your starting running back. Let's say they drafted Dobbins instead, and he's going absolutely ham bone, and he's about to win off as a rookie of the year. You don't bring in Le'Veon Bell if that's the case. You bring in Le'Veon Bell if you feel like you're missing something in your backfield. You have Daryl Williams as a capable backup. If it was a simple like, oh, maybe he's just not picking up protection schemes uh, that much. Fine, don't use him on third down. You have Daryl Williams for that job. But they must have felt like they were missing something on the goal line, in the receiving game, pass blocking, all that kind of stuff contributed to them bringing in Le'Veon Bell. And that's the lesson you got to take away from Clyde edwards helaire is that just because he was a first-round pick, just because we wanted him to get all the fantasy production, doesn't mean that the coach is just going to 
um, just shove the ball into his belly 25 times a game. And also another kind of lesson to tie into this is if you think a guy's a better player and he lands in a slightly worse situation, don't just tank his ranking because, oh, this mediocre player got dropped into the best situation possible. Like, for example, for a lot of people in the industry, DeAndre Swift was the RB1 from a talent perspective coming out of that draft, lands on the Lions. Nobody wants anything to do with him. Everybody going into that draft was like, oh, you know, a Clyde edwards hilarious is going to be a solid day two type pick, probably RB5 or so in the class. Gets picked by the Chiefs. Everybody hails him as a top five dynasty back. Being so reactive to a landing spot instead of really evaluating what a player's true talent is, is how you fall in love with the landing spot versus the player in the landing spot. So Especially what they do well, too. Because what Clyde yeah. does well is catch the ball, right? He, that's my yeah. probably his best attribute. But yeah. we knew this. Like Patrick Mahomes not going to throw checkdowns. Like that's We knew this going into the season. It'd be the same thing if Clyde had landed in Houston, where we know Deshaun Watson doesn't throw checkdowns. Or yeah. we saw with J.K. Dobbins. Lamar Jackson doesn't throw checkdowns. Like that is that's another big thing of Clyde's value that we expected to get, which we didn't see. We expected to get a guy who was going to catch 50, 60 passes, and that was exactly not the case. And the reason was because one, Mahomes didn't have a high propensity to throw him the ball. There had to be a reason for that. Maybe he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. Maybe he wasn't executing on third down pass blocking, and they took him off the field. That is all the things that contributed to Clyde being a bust. And I think Clyde was the biggest bust in fantasy, personally. I, agree. I think. Of this year, you can talk about Saquon and getting injured and McCaffrey getting injured and all that kind of stuff, but Clyde was on the field the whole season and he didn't produce. And only the only other guy you really could have said that about up until a couple of weeks ago was Jonathan Taylor, to be honest. So I think the, the big lesson to take away from Clyde is it's it's a combination of talent. It's a combination of coaching. If you believe in a guy's talent and you assume rational coaching on that team, then that guy is going to flourish. If you assume the guy's talented or maybe you don't think he's talented and you assume rational coaching on that on that coaching staff, then you assume they're going to give him the opportunity initially uh, initially like they did with Clyde and if he's not producing they're going to they're going to pivot away from that. So Clyde edwards helaire is going to be a fascinating situation going into yeah. next year. I honestly I honestly I think it only comes down to him playing better. I think if he plays better, he's going to get the volume, he's going to get the receiving work, he's going to get the goal line work. That's what Andy Reid's going to give him if he plays better. And that's going to be the big question going into next year for him. Yeah, no, and I fully agree here. And as uh, like, as I mentioned, they were to the point of him not feeling confident in him to the point that they brought a veteran in to really take a hit on his overall production, as we saw in those last seven versus those first six. If you're not performing in the NFL, they're going to find a way to limit your overall attempts, your overall opportunities in a situation. So, uh, with that being said, what, what's your third claim or uh, point for less? Okay, seven? this one should be relatively quick because we knew this going in, and this was a hit of ours. This was not a miss. We missed on Clyde edwards helaire both of us. I picked him at yeah. sixth overall in my home league. I still ended up winning it, but this <laughs> was a hit. AJ <laughs> Brown, <laughs> DK Metcalf, Terry McLaurin, all these guys, these young dudes that we were touting as breakout candidates, we said they were going to break out, right? So the lesson was... Uh, behind this was you always want to be willing to invest in young ascending players entering their primes as opposed to older quote unquote bounce back candidates, right? Yeah. You're going to hit at a far higher percentage betting on these guys, these ascending players than you are uh, hitting on bounce back candidates who are maybe past their primes. And I would argue also that when you're hitting on a young ascending player, the ceiling is much higher than a bounce back candidate as well. If you're caught next year in a draft between a breakout and a bounce back decision, let's say this year, you were caught between Odell Beckham Jr. and DK Metcalf, right? Two dichotomies, totally different situations. Odell Beckham Jr., we've seen him do it before. We've seen him produce at a very high level. DK Metcalf, not so much. But DK Metcalf is a young, talented receiver. Not that Odell Beckham isn't either, but one is entering their prime and one is already in their prime or even maybe even past their prime. For most of the offseason, we had guys like Odell Beckham. We had guys like Juju Smith-Schuster. We had T.Y. Hilton, A.J. Green, Julian Edelman. These guys were going around guys coming off of poor showings in their previous seasons going ahead of guys like AJ Brown and DK Metcalf and Terry McLaurin and Stefan Diggs and Deontay Johnson guys that we had faith in that we had faith in their situations. We had faith in their ability to produce and get better as they got more acclimated to the NFL into their situation. So the big lesson for me is always will be willing to invest in young ascending players. And I think that's something we definitely hit on this season. Yep. I fully agree. And uh, as you mentioned, Guys that could be seeing that type of treatment going into next year, the, oh, he has to regress type treatment. Uh, we could be talking about, for example, Justin Jefferson. He was way too uber efficient going into last season. There's no chance that he should be a top three round pick is what we could be saying going into next summer. Well, 
If he's falling out of those first three rounds. If someone picks Odell Beckham over Justin Jefferson next year, I literally will lose my mind. Uh, he, he, dude, even like a like a Julio Jones, for example. I love or Juju Smith-Schuster. If someone wants to pick Juju over over uh, Justin Jefferson, I'll lose my mind. Yeah, no, I, and I fully agree. And we're looking at guys like that. Justin Jefferson, even CeeDee Lamb, people are going to say, oh, he was way too efficient when he had Doc. No. T. Higgins. Oh, Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk, he was way too efficient. People are always going to find ways to skew the data as being, quote, unquote, way too efficient. Oh, he's not going to be like that next year. Well, guess what? If you were super efficient year one, there's more than likely going to be an increase in targets for you going into the following year. Yep. So I love buying these these uh, first-year players going into their second year because people just want to drive the too efficient narrative and just scooping them up at a tremendous value. And if you're able to capitalize that off of last year, as Corey mentioned, AJ Brown, DK Metcalf, Terry McCoy. These add the guys that did. Uh, remember that thread I did last year, uh, yeah. where I talked about guys that received uh, 750 plus receiving yards despite getting screen. less than 100 targets. There's guys that did it this year, and they're going to be going into uh, into that metric. And I'm going to see how the guys last year improved on their volume because we saw across the board Terry McLaurin got more targets, DK Metcalf got more targets, uh, even right. Darius Slayton, who had a down season, got more targets. Like that's just the, the result of you being efficient means you getting more volume. What yep. you do with that volume is a, is a testament to your talent as a player, your situation, your quarterback, all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is if you are efficient as a rookie, you are going to get more volume in your second year. And uh, these guys, Brandon Ayuk and T. Higgins, and, and these guys are going to be examples of that. It's not a perfect rule. This young ascending player thing is not a perfect rule. We had guys like Marquise Brown, who we, we were touting as a breakout candidate going into the season. He he was very disappointing this season up until like Gallup. recently. He's Yeah, Michael Gallup. We had young ascending players that can happen. They can disappoint. But generally speaking, a guy with pro- positive career momentum, he, he's coming off a season where he got better, he improved, and he, he looks to get better in his next season. Those guys entering their prime is almost always a safer projection than a guy who has disappointed recently, or even more so a guy who is older and has, has disappointed recently also. So that's that's a big lesson for us that we hit on. I think it probably helped a lot of you who listened to us in the, in the offseason uh, talk about guys like A.J. Brown. It probably helped you guys. Uh, win some championships or make the playoffs or anything like that. So why don't you get into your next uh, lesson that we learned here? Next one I'm going to talk about is um, vacated production from one year doesn't mean that there's going to be a a future year production uh, from somebody else or a new signing or a new trade. The main uh, proof of this would be my love and my hype for Hayden Hurst going into the season. Because the big thing around Hayden Hurst, okay, he's the backup tight end on the Ravens. He was looking to fish on the Ravens. Then he gets traded to the Atlanta Falcons. Well, why did we like the Atlanta Falcons as a landing spot to begin with? There was a ton of vacated production left by Austin Hooper signing with the Browns in free agency. People were saying going into the last season that the vacated production from one situation is better than counting on a second year breakout with less vacated production, if you will, or less available production, if you will. Well, just because a player has vacated production available, and if you don't know what I mean by vacated production, if you're watching this video, vacated production is production from a person's same position on a team from one year and saying, well, he that position is going to garner as much volume, as much targets, as much overall potential going into the next year. Austin Hooper was a top three tight end in 2019. And just because Hayden Hurst is entering the situation as the Atlanta Falcons new tight end, doesn't automatically say he's going to get all of Austin Hooper's production. So my main thing, I know it's pretty worded, worded pretty weird. I don't necessarily how to make it sound easy. I know, I know what you mean. I can, I can help try and rephrase it if if you you want um, me to. Basically, we expected a lot of production from Hayden Hurst early on, on Atlanta because of what Austin Hooper did, when in reality here, there's still a learning curve. You still have to learn the system. You still have to gain the quarterback's chemistry, the quarterback's trust, to the point that all that all that vacated production we expected Hayden Hurst to step into, to walk into, we saw a big leap from a guy like Calvin Ridley, who was in the system the year before, who was learning, who was getting better as a receiver, who stepped into that more productive, more productive role, which in the end was probably the main reason why they felt comfortable with leaving Austin Hooper behind. Because Calvin really was ready to take on more opportunity, not because Hayden Hurst was just going to step in and take that opportunity, if you will. Yeah, I think the vacated production argument is much more effective for someone who already has the trust of the quarterback, who's already in the system, to take that next step. We saw that with Chris Godwin when when Deshaun Jackson and Adam Humphreys left. We saw Chris Godwin, the vacated production argument come up over and over again with him, but it was valid with him, right? He had already been with Jameis Winston for two years before that. 
We saw it with Calvin Ridley. He'd already been with Matt Ryan for two years before that. We saw it even with Ronald Jones. Peyton Barber left. He'd already been in the system. He'd already been um, with Bruce Arians and Byron left, which they already had his trust. The vacated production argument carries less weight is basically the lesson for new additions, free agents and draft picks. I think the, the vacated production argument carries much more weight to the people who are already there who should see an increase in their roles. So uh, just keep that in mind for next year. I'm sure we're going to have players move around teams and and uh, get signed in free agency and all that kind of stuff. So just keep that in mind. If you hear the vacated production argument, let's say Aaron Jones goes to San Francisco or something like that. And they're like, oh, Aaron Jones is a vacated production in, in Green Bay is going to go to this new draft pick that Green Bay um, drafts. It could go to AJ Dillon. It could go to Jamal Williams, whoever they decided to keep in that example. So that's a big takeaway for me. Um, and I, I think it's it's a pretty valid one overall. Yeah, and that was uh, worded a lot better than now how I added. But basically, yeah, the overall emphasis is emphasize these players who are returning to the same position or same situation when talking about this vacated production rather than referring to new signings or new trades or people that are entering the system, new draft picks. Because in the end, those players that are familiar with the system are going to get that slight bump. The people that are getting signed, we don't know necessarily what the role is intended to be on the new team. So. Yeah. <laughs> continuity has been a big theme of this and continuity is basically how you determine safe players from risky players in the draft, basically. And then uh, going into our next claim here, we have another lesson that we learned. And again, this is one that we did hit on. This is one that I told you specifically, and we told you uh, overall in this entire channel, yep. pay attention to camp reports, camp reports and training camp is a huge, huge indicator of people who are going to break out people who might disappoint people who are going to see increased roles, all that kind of stuff. And the prime example of this is Ronald Jones being the, the the primary running back in Tampa Bay. Everyone and their mother on fantasy Twitter wanted to write off Ronald Jones, right? They wanted to tell you he's no good. He's, he he's sucks at long. football. He can't catch. He has, which is true, but he can't carry the workload, right? Bruce Aarons is a liar. He, he would never just say this out of, out of being honest to the media. If you pay attention closely and you listen to what comes out of camps uh, preseason, and I'll start as soon as mini camps before the draft, because there's going to be um, not mini camps, sorry, mini camps right after the draft. Uh, you can glean basically what coaches are thinking, what teammates are thinking, what position coaches are thinking, what uh, quarterbacks are thinking. Just because the fantasy community wanted Keyshawn Vaughn and Leonard Fournette to take over that backfield doesn't mean it was actually going to happen. If you heard with every signing they had, with every addition they had, I went through a lot of news before the season. There was a video I put out right uh, about Labor Day weekend where I said news roundup. Basically, it was a roundup of all the news going into the season. And basically what we heard, if you watch that video, you would have hit on guys like James Robinson, like Antonio Gibson, who had positive camp buzz coming into the season. And basically the prime example was Ronald Jones, as I mentioned. And things that you heard out of Ronald Jones and Tampa Bay's camp was when they signed LaShawn McCoy, Basically, LaShawn McCoy said they're competing, or sorry, Bruce Arians said they're competing behind Ronald Jones, which yeah. basically tells me that um, LaShawn McCoy was Dario Gumbawale's replacement in the in the offense. LaShawn McCoy, when he was signed, was quoted as saying, it's his role, it's his job, I'm here to help him in any way possible. When Keyshawn Vaughn was brought in, Bruce Arians was asked, what is his role going to be early in the season? He said, maybe as a kick returner. When Leonard Fournette was brought in, he was basically adamant in saying, it's still Ronald Jones's job. We heard the same patterns over and over again. But if you listen to fantasy Twitter instead of the coach's mouth uh, and the teammate's mouth actually playing with the players, you would have hit on Ronald Jones. You would have drafted him in the sixth round in every single draft like I did. And he was, I mean, he was a little up and down when he fumbled and when he dropped passes. But the overlying theme of the season for Ronald Jones was that when he was on the field, he was the starting running back. Yep. And uh, again, you you mentioned it. How many different instances this summer we, we would look at a report and there would be people on Twitter saying, oh, whatever, it's just coach speak. Uh, I, I like this guy better, so this guy's going to be the guy. I like Leonard Fournette better than a R Big Ronald example Trump. of that was Brian Edwards. Every time they'd say something positive about Henry Ruggs, it was, oh, well, Brian Edwards is going to take over that receiving core anyway. It's like, what, they didn't, you're not even talking about him. What are you talking about? Yeah, and like, for example, going into camp, if I had valued – this this could be a negative for, uh, for it as well because if I had valued more of what they were saying about C.D. Lamb coming out of Dallas camp, saying, he oh, he looks like a, a polished veteran – Maybe I could have seared a little bit off of Michael Gallup at that point. Maybe you could say, okay, you know yeah. what? Maybe C.D. Lamb is just that talented, stepped into the situation that quick, was able to establish himself that quick. And that actually leans into my next point, uh, my fourth claim, is that the main thing that we were saying all summer was going to be that rookies are going to struggle out of the gate, especially with the short and off season. What I really gathered about that is we were 50% right on it. For the running backs, 
they were struggling out of the gate. For those receivers, though, they stepped in right away and were able to perform. One of the biggest points that we could really take out of this is the only two running backs to garner a consistent 50% or more snaps in their first four games of the season was James Robinson, who in reality they had no healthy backs on that roster. Freaking Ryqual Armstead went on COVID list. Is he alive? Like, literally. <laughs> I think he's still on COVID list as we speak. Yeah. Vino Zigbo, Dario Gumwale, who just got cut from Tampa. No. And then we look at CEH, who, yes, he was getting that 50% plus role, and then they brought Le'Veon Bell in. So yeah. what we saw from these receivers is they stepped in pro-ready early and shined. I mean, we're talking about guys like CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Jerry Judy, uh, T. Higgins. Henry Ruggs had a huge touch on his first game. All these guys stepped in to the roles that we expected right away and performed. What you can really gather from this is when people start saying in the offseason, going into your draft – Oh, these ro- these rookie receivers are going to have a learning curve, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I'm going to let a guy like Justin Jefferson fall to the 11th, 12th round. We are already gone through that. Justin Jefferson is a very talented player, going to be uh, a- at least the number two receiver on a-, a decently scoring team in Minnesota. Why would he be able to uh, – or why would he be available, sorry, in the 11th, 12th round? I don't care that he's a rookie. He's a talented player, and he's in a situation to perform. Whereas we were talking about a guy like, I don't know, uh, even DeAndre Swift, I really like a lot. Jonathan Taylor, I really liked a lot. All these guys, that these running backs that we were taking the top four rounds saying, oh, you know what? Yes, it's going to be an ambiguous backfield right away, but the talent's going to win out within these first few weeks. No, no. We were talent saying- Talent meets opportunity. That's the rule. And with wide receivers, it's much easier to establish yourself in an offense because there's not three running backs on the field at the same time. Usually there's usually three wide receivers on the field at the same time. So if you're a talented receiver, the quarterback drops back and you're open every play, guess what? You're going to get the ball. So it doesn't matter that Justin Jefferson was behind Adam Thielen because there had to be another receiver on the field, like 80% of the time. And if he was the most talented option behind Adam Thielen, then he was going to be that guy with the Andre Swift and Cam Akers. you, you, You generally speaking only have one running back on the field at the same time. Right? So if you are not, maybe equipped to to be into the pro game quite yet in pass protection or some other area, then they're going to favor the veteran uh, option just because th- they're quicker at making reads in the, in the lanes and, and hitting their holes in the running lanes. They're quicker yeah. at picking up blitz pickups and they're quicker at getting the ball and, and turning up field once they catch it. St- stuff like that happens. Talent is important uh, for the running back position, especially, but talent uh, needs to meet opportunity. And that's the initial takeaway. What I gather from that is if these guys, these running backs are going in that third, fourth, fifth round area that you're not sure they're going to get the volume right away, don't be the one to draft them. Pick them up after week four, week five. They've been struggling a little bit. You probably could have gotten Jonathan Taylor even in week eight or nine. You could have gotten Jonathan Taylor for four. Yeah. It's just crazy to think that these running backs struggle out of the gate. People are surprised. They're like, oh my God, what should I do? I picked this guy this high, yada, yada, yada. Whereas... People were saying all that about the receivers in the offseason, and yet they were the ones that were producing right away. So yeah. we we said it right off the bat. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything from you guys. I was saying it. Maybe these receivers are going to struggle out of the gate. They landed on these teams. I don't know what the rules are going to be, yada, yada. If you took all of that value that was created from it and got a C.D. Lamb in the 10th, got a Justin Jefferson in the 11th, got a, heck, you probably could have gotten a guy like T. Higgins in the 15th round. It's just it's crazy that we let these guys slip every year. Even talk about the previous year, DK Metcalf, um, AJ Brown, Terry McLaurin. All these guys are probably going in the last rounds of your draft. This is going to keep happening because all these talented the NFL is getting receivers. easier. Really, that's that's what it's coming down to. Offense is so easy in the NFL now that people like players are coming from the college game, and it also helps that we're getting just some incredible receiver and classes. That's what I was gonna say too. Like all these receivers that are coming in, all these talented rookie receivers that are coming in, there's an influx of talent. It ain't changing this year either. Position. And I'm gonna tell you, guys like Jalen Waddle, Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, Rashad Bateman, if they're going in the 14th, 15th round, like what Justin Jefferson, CD Lamb, Jerry Judy was going basically this year, I don't think I'll miss on any of them in my drafts going into next year. Because well, they're that hit, probably players, not they're probably again, like not all of them are gonna hit, but out of every two that don't hit. It's basically been two or three that have been hitting. And if you're getting a guy at that late value who can return in reality, top 24 wide receiver value, I'm taking that chance a hundred times out of a hundred. And even if you hit once or twice, 
it's well worth the investment. Yeah. So. If you if you in the the last 10, let's say you rounds 10 to 16 this year, you drafted six straight rookie receivers. You drafted CD Lamb in the 10th round. You drafted Justin Jefferson in the 11th round, Jerry Judy in the 12th round, Henry Ruggs in the 13th round, Jalen Rager in the 14th round, Chase Claypool in the 15th round, T. Higgins in the 16th round. Guess what? You got three starting receivers out of that. Yeah. Which honestly, you might not have even been able to say that if you took um, six straight receivers rounds four through seven or, so, or uh, rounds four through 10. Because sure. like the wide receiver position is is really all talent meets opportunity. Injuries play a big part in it. And if you took a T Higgins and AJ Green were to have gotten injured or were to have been banged up, like what happened basically, then you have that opportunity that T Higgins becomes a top 24 receiver, which he was. He was top 15 receiver and points per, uh, points per game throughout most of the season. So that's a big point of emphasis. I would say that also applies to the quarterbacks as well, because we saw yeah. Justin Herbert come in guns a blazing. We saw Joe Burrow come in guns a blazing too, and not so much, but those guys were not supposed to be fantasy assets their first year in the NFL. And we could have said that two years ago too, with Kyler Murray, he was not supposed to be a fantasy asset his first year in the NFL. But when you can run, when you have big, ar- when you have a big arm, when you can, um, when you're put in a situation where you have offensive playmakers to throw to, that that is, that's going to happen. That's basically uh, how the NFL works now. It's not 2005 anymore. They're not coming into the NFL with no experience in an NFL offense. Colleges are running better offenses now, and NFL uh, play callers are running more college schemes. So it, it's way easier for these passing games to translate to the NFL than it was even five years ago. And heck, if you want to translate this to dynasty, let's just say, you're in your rookie draft, Expect that if you take a running back early, they're not necessarily going to perform in those first four games. And maybe their peak value is going to be at the draft. So if you can turn the 101 into multiple first round picks and be able to take, I don't know, we'll, we'll talk about just last year. If you were able to flip the 101 for, say, the 106, the 109, and the 112, which is a reasonable trade that was going around around that time, and you ended up with C.D. Lamb, Jerry Judy, Justin Jefferson with those three picks – it's insane because in reality, four you could flip. Ago, you could flip Jerry Judy right not even Justin Jefferson or Ceedee Lamb. You could probably flip Jerry Judy right now for Clyde edwards lair Exactly. So, I mean, if, if you're looking at it, expect these young receivers to not have that steep learning curve we once expected from them two, three, four years ago that we were seeing. Because I'll tell you right now, these 2018 to 2022 wide receiver classes are going to be the best five year stretch we've seen in quite a while because that's how talented these kids are coming in. <laughs> yeah, basically. And yeah, we'll, we'll keep you updated throughout the off season about the best players to invest in best situations, all the, all the breakdowns of the NFL draft uh, from a fantasy perspective. We're not NFL draft scouts. We don't pretend to be NFL draft scouts, but what we're going to tell you is how to evaluate these guys from a fantasy perspective, which I don't think anyone else on the internet does very well in my opinion. So um, sure. just keep, keep tuned for the, uh, to the channel for that. If you made it this far in the video, you can see I have a pimple on my nose. Comment down below, pimple. And while you're down there, hit the like button, comment on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new, hit the bell icon, all that good stuff. Here's my last claim. We Going into the season, we were not a fan of Todd Gurley. We were not. We, we didn't like Todd Gurley at all. And one guy that I was a big fan of was Josh Jacobs, right? I, I thought he was going to break out. But the takeaway from both of these two guys from uh, opposite ends of the spectrum is that schedules do matter. Early schedules matter for fantasy and no one talks about it. I don't know why. If you listen to uh, a lot of fantasy analysts and ones that I actually very much respect, they kind of disregard strength of schedule at the beginning of the season. I don't know why they talk about it with quarterbacks and defenses, but they don't talk about it with running backs and wide receivers. And in my opinion, I think it's very easy to evaluate if a wide receiver matchup is going to be bad. You just look at the cornerback on the opposite side. Yeah. Uh, who potentially plays shadow coverage or for run defenses, they generally don't change year over year. Like typically we know the Philadelphia Eagles are going to have a good run defense. We know that the Baltimore Ravens are going to have a good run defense. We, we know, know that the Pittsburgh Steelers. Pardon? We know that the Cowboys are going to have a bad yeah, one. Yeah, like we, we can generally uh, pick out. And plus, if you follow the NFL free agency and the draft and all that kind of stuff, you know the additions to the team and you know how the their defense might change as a result. All that kind of stuff contributes to knowing that Todd Gurley might have actually been a pretty good draft pick. And the reason why is because his schedule, I'll put it up on the screen right now, his first nine games, he had some of the worst run defenses in the league. And because of that, he was able to get into the end zone a lot. And if you listen to me week nine, when I said to trade him, you know the reason why is because he played the Saints twice and the Bucks twice over the last uh, six games of the season. And that all that kind of stuff contributes to being able to separate draft strategy from in-season strategy. 
But the difference that I, I, I believe, and I'm sure you believe this as well, is that they're not all that different. Draft strategy should be contributing to you winning games early in the season because you winning games early in the season leads you to make trades to upgrade your Todd Gurley to a Christian McCaffrey or upgrade your Todd Gurley to a an Alvin Kamara late in the season because Alvin Kamara maybe is having a down stretch in his schedule. Yeah. We all talk about strength of schedule and this guy's a bad matchup, sit him, all that kind of stuff. Once the season begins, once week one, toe hits leather, we all care about schedule all of a sudden, but no one talks about it during the draft. So yeah. make sure you, you keep that in mind when you're drafting. If you see that Saquon Barkley, for example, this year going into the season, we knew Saquon had a bad schedule. Don't take him. Don't pick him. If you think he has a bad schedule, don't pick him and pick someone else instead and trade for Saquon Barkley five weeks into the season. Yeah, no, fully. And, um, yeah, we again, we saw a ton of examples this year. If you held Todd Gurley after that initial schedule, you're probably not too thrilled. I'm just going to say that right now. No, you're at not. You point, probably didn't even start him in your playoffs. At one point this season, after week nine, after we were able to really see coming into the season, his schedule was wide open as it could have been. Heck, going into the season, we knew that Dallas Cowboys couldn't stop the run. We knew that the Bears could stop the run. We knew that the Carolina Panthers could not stop the run. Vikings we knew that the Texans could stop, stop, stop the run. All these teams could stop the run, and yet we let that affect. We didn't really let that affect our Todd Gurley negative negativity. Sorry, to the degree it should have. However, that doesn't change the fact that after Week Ten, once he started playing some real defenses, his value went from high on RB two amongst the community, which is probably what you could have traded him as his value for. You could have, so, you could have gotten an RB one value for him. At you one probably point. could have gotten an RB one value to be quite honest So He was basically unusable. That second shot, eh, second stretch of the season. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely. As Corey mentioned, really value that early schedule because again, it's going to create an opportunity in the market to get really good values to sell really high. Because people are just going to look at the stats without looking at the context of the situation. And that kind of leans into my next Can I just or- say one more thing? Because we were more. consistent about this for some players, but we weren't across all of our analysis. That's yes. what our big mistake was, is that for guys like Devontae Parker, I saw his schedule. I was like, holy crap. This guy's got like Stefan Gilmore twice in the first fucking six weeks of the season. He's got Tredavious White twice in the first eight weeks of the season. Like this dude has some bad shadow matchups coming up. And that made me pivot off of Devontae Parker. And it made me like a guy like Mark Ingram going into the season because I saw his schedule. It made me like certain guys over others. And people say this all the time. You don't win your draft or you don't win your championship after your draft. It's very true. It is 100% true. You do not win your championship at your draft. And those of you that are in leagues where someone just like drafted a team and kept them the whole season, I'm willing to bet you unless they just drafted the perfect team that they did not win their championship. The guy who... Um, came in first in the regular season in my league, basically just drafted and didn't make a single move, but he got ousted in the first round of the playoffs. Why? Because Cooper Cup wasn't performing very well uh, at the back half of the season. Todd Gurley wasn't performing very well at the back half of the season. Guys that he had drafted that he thought, James Robinson even too, um, that weren't performing early in the, or that were performing early in the season were not doing it the entire season. And the reason was because if he looked ahead to his schedules and if he looked ahead to some of the moves he could have made, he could have very much, very easily mitigated that risk. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Being able to capitalize on value is how, how you're going to become a good fantasy football player. And schedules are probably the biggest part of playing fantasy that no one talks about enough, in my opinion. So you, you can get into your last one. We actually sure. are going yeah. throughout this at a higher pace than I thought we were going yeah. to. So yeah, it's uh, doing pretty well. But the final claim that I'm going to, I'm going to mention is uh, the, the strategy that everybody across the industry, including us was saying was you have to pay, you have to get your RBs early. You have to get your RBs early uh, wide receivers. You can wait on because let's be honest, these running backs are how you're going to win your championships. The lesson that I got from this is that the market will always correct itself. Now, Talking about the basis of that strategy, the basis of that strategy was really off of what we saw in 2019. I'm going to put the graph or you're going to put the graphic up on the screen of basically what you tweeted in that in 2019, only two players in the entire NFL scored double digit touchdowns. Galladay had 11, Andrews had 10. In 2020, we saw eight players accomplish this. Adams and that was from weeks from one to 16 during fantasy uh, time, just for the record, because yeah. Cooper Cup in 2019 did score. 10 touchdowns, but he scored one in week 17. Yep. Uh, talking about 2020, eight players accomplished this from weeks 1 to 16. We saw Adams, 17, Hill, 15, Thielen, 14, Evans, 13, Kelsey, 11, and then Metcalf, Brown, and Tunyon all at 10. Now, what do you gather from this? 
Well, in 2019, the average of the top five receivers compared to the top 10 running backs. The reason why I took this sample is because you normally expect the fifth best receiver to be on par with around the 10th best running back in terms of overall points per game. Now, what you take from this? In 2019, the average of the top five receivers was 16.26 PP, uh, points per game in half PPR, whereas the half PPR running backs averaged 17.73. So the discrepancy there, almost 1.5 points per game leaning the running backs way. 16.26 for receivers, 17.73 for running backs. Well, how did that fare in 2020? What happened to the data? What happened to the statistics from last year compared to this year? Well, that number for receivers rose dramatically. It went from 16.26 half PPR points per game across the top five to 17.9 points per game across the top five. And how did it fare for the running backs? Well, the market actually reverted back negatively where the points per game from the top 10 running backs dropped from 17.73 to 17.16. What did we gather from this? Well, going into last year, there's a 1.5 discrepancy in favor for running backs. This year, it actually was 0.74 the other way favoring receivers. The market's always going to adjust itself. So as soon as you put emphasis on grabbing one position and one position only because, quote unquote, value dictates it should favor this way based off one year of research, you have to really balance the past few years to gain a full understanding and knowledge of the discrepancy between the fifth best receiver and the 10th best running back as opposed to the top at each position. So ultimately, being able to balance seasons out rather than taking a, a lot of bias off the previous season's total and projecting that forward is ultimately going to be a, or how you're going to be able to get ahead of these trends, get ahead of these curves. Because going into last season, with a, with a down receiver season and an up running back position, we overvalued the heck out of these running backs as opposed to these top receivers. People were taking guys like Josh Jacobs, uh, Joe Mixon, Kenyon Drake, over even guys like Devontae Adams and Tyree Kill. And heck, if you did that this year, you're probably looking back at your draft and saying, my, oh, my, I missed out on a league winner because I was so opposed to going receiver early. Being able to be uh, flexible and vary from groupthink is ultimately how you're going to get a competitive edge. So that's my main takeaway. Again, don't just take a guy because he's at a position you like. Take the guy because he's going to present the most value opposed to other options at the position. Yeah, and it comes back down to situation and opportunity and all that kind of stuff that we talked about before, yeah. right? Because if you looked objectively... Do you want the running back for the Cincinnati Bengals offense? Or do you want the number one wide receiver for Aaron Rodgers? Or do you want the number one wide receiver for Patrick, Patrick Mahomes, Mahomes, right? That didn't make any sense. If you think if you think about it objectively, why would you want Joe Mixon over Tyree Kill or Devontae Adams? It doesn't make any sense. And we fell victim to it. We, we did it. I had a feeling going into the season that like fading the public, uh, trademarked by BDG, but doing that would be the smart play because everyone was going running back early. And I think people who picked wide receiver earlier, or maybe who went uh, one or the other, like running back uh, in the first round wide receiver in the second round or vice versa, they probably ended up with good teams in the league, our listener league that I won the championship in. I had Austin Eckler in the first round, Devonte Adams in the second, that was diametrically opposed to what everyone else was doing because I passed on Kenyon Drake. I passed on, uh, I think Aaron Jones or someone else that was a running back at the time to pick Devonte Adams. Not a lot of people were doing that. And that ended up being the smart play because like you said, the market adjusted itself. We did not see a lot of touchdown scores in 2019. If you go back to 2018's data, we saw a lot more in 2018. And actually the same exact thing happened in 2017. 2017, we didn't see a lot of running back or wide receiver scoring touchdowns. And again, the market adjusted itself in 2018. So we're on this weird trend of like every odd year, the like wide receivers are being undervalued for some reason. And uh, I, I think honestly, Generally speaking, running back scarcity is a real thing. There's less starting running backs in the NFL uh, for fantasy purposes than there is wide receivers, but don't take it to the extreme. Don't overthink a super safe option, a super uh, great option that has just as much upside as that running back, if not more, for a running back specifically because he plays running back. It, it, was, just the, it was just comical when you think about it. We were taking the RB9, RB10 over the wide receiver two last year. Just and because we were getting as bad as some people. Let's point, give ourselves some credit because yeah. I wasn't in on a guy like Kenyon Drake. I didn't think I'd be yeah. taking a guy like Kenyon Drake over Devontae Adams because I thought that was just completely asinine. But we did do it to some degree. And yeah. the entire and industry like did it to, most, uh, to the nth degree. So that is a big lesson. Yeah. Do not get yourself stuck in a draft strategy. Do not go into a draft being like, I have to get one of the top three tight ends, or I have to get a Patrick Mahomes, or I have to get a, a early quarterback, or I have to get a lot of running backs early. 
Just don't go into a draft with that kind of strategy. You need to be weighing players based on a lot of factors, talent, situation, opportunity, upside, floor, all that kind of stuff plays in. And their position is a secondary aspect of it. And it's only to be used as a tiebreaker, in my opinion, uh, a running back over a receiver. If you deem that they have the exact same upside, exact same floor, exact same type of situation, exact same type of value, only then do you pick the running back. You don't only do it because he's a running back. For sure. Heck, we always argue about, well, this position is more scarce than the other. Well, heck, if you argue that for Devontae Adams this year, well, let me just say that guy averaged over five points per game more than the next best receiver. So uh, yep. if you want to, if you want to argue value over replacement, that's some value over replacement to the finest degree. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And if you add Devonte Adams, you probably won your championship because not only did he score 17 touchdowns throughout the season, he scored three in your, in your championship if you yep. were in it. So um, that was a lot of content. It was a lot of, uh, a value. lot of lessons, <laughs> a lot of value in this episode. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you did enjoy it, please let us know in the comments that you enjoyed us, uh, enjoyed it. Let us know any ideas you have for future videos. We're into off season content. This is the time that me and Danny can be creative. We don't have to talk about starts and sits and, and waiver wire targets that you all need during the season. We can be more creative. We can do what you guys want us to talk about. Um, we'll put the work in, make sure you guys, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like, if you're new to the channel, if you thought that, wow, these guys really know their stuff, this was, this was really valuable, uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, hit the bell icon. So you never, uh, miss an upload of ours. And I encourage you guys to come back and listen to this before you draft, because yeah. we have the instant reaction feeling. We talked about this with the mock draft, uh, the other day, which, uh, a lot of support on that, by the a way, a lot of support. Yeah. So thank <laughs> you for that. But come back and listen to this before you draft, because this is lessons that you might forget throughout the uh, off season uh, process of breaking down all these players and getting clouding views on all these guys. This is a process that you might forget. And some of these common sense things that we talked about here might go out the window when you just see the opportunity of someone like Kenyon Drake in his new landing spot or something like that. So just keep that in mind. I hope you guys enjoyed. Peace out. Peace out y'all.